Thank you very much for this invitation. I owe a lot, not only to the Biennale for this opportunity, uh, but also to the urban age to give context to some of the things that we've been doing as a private practice, uh, but eventually to be able to gain a bigger perspective about the importance and uh, or the challenges uh, of, the, uh, of the built environment ahead. So the plan for today, for this 15 minutes, and I don't finish this whole presentation, it's fine. I can, when I, I see the three minute sign, I can stop. Uh, so it's uh, perfectly fine. But um, about the question, uh, the, what role for architecture? I would say, before going into this thing, the role for architecture, I would say, is synthesis. The kind of issues ahead are so complex that the more complex the problem, the more the need for synthesis. In the end, the forces that shape the built environment tend to come from very different realms, and they eventually they pull in opposite directions. So the, what's needed there is a capacity to channel those forces in a common goal. An architecture at its very core has the capacity to organize information in a proposal key. So diagnosis is fine, but ultimately the risk of making a proposal has to be taken, and I guess at the very core of architecture is that. That's the role of design. In the end, what architects do is to give form to the places where people live. Is not more complicated than that, but also not easier than that. The form of places where people live and uh, what informs the form of those places is the way we're trying to engage as architects, as designers, in this bigger question of improving quality of life through the built environment. So going to, to the presentation, <clears throat> there's, uh, the urban age has been extremely important in making all of us, including architects, but the society at large, to understand that we're living in this urban age, which is good news and bad news. The good news, I guess that's why cities are in a way a magnet, is that cities are a concentration of opportunities, of jobs, of education, of health, of, and, and recreation. That's why people come to cities, and they will keep on coming, and this, in principle, is excellent news. Cities are also very powerful vehicles to deliver public policies, to improve quality, people's quality of life. They, it's more efficient, access to sanitation, to education and transportation, it, they can, it can be delivered more efficiently if people is concentrated in space. And ultimately, it's important, and cities are good news, because they have critical mass, and more and more, the competitiveness of cities will come from knowledge creation. The more people you have, the more people physically meet, forget about social media, internet, we, will, we still need to meet. That's why we actually meet physically here. So the, the critical mass of cities are, is going to be crucial in knowledge creation, which will be leading development and economic uh, growth. So that's why, even if counterintuitive, the more people coming to cities, the better. The problem is that I would say until not long ago, maybe a couple of man months, uh, we thought that this, the downside of this, the bomb part, is that there was a threat mainly from what we call the three S menace. The scale, speed, and scarcity of means, sorry, we can. So, the threat comes, we thought, as I said, not long ago, from the three S menace, the scale, speed, and scarcity of means, which translated into numbers means that we have to build for one million people per week with $10,000 per family. That's the, the level of migration of, towards cities. So Germany was worried about one million immigrants a year. Well, as a, as a world, we need to deal with one million migrants per week with $10,000 per family. So we thought it was that, the threat, but I guess there's another one, and somehow it is connected to the events of, I didn't know, I just found out this morning, uh, the kind of threats that we're, we're witnessing and we're experiencing comes not only from poverty, but mainly from inequalities, and I guess the question of peripheries in developed countries where, as I, if it was a social time bomb, where pressure is accumulating, 
is not only in developing countries. I thought uh, we had a lot of that in Latin America. I guess that the peripheries in Europe are, are not that different. So one would have thought that the bomb side, the, the pressure accumulating was in the poor countries in the world. I guess right now more and more it cuts across. It's from, for, the, for the rich and for the poor countries of the world. In any case, <clears throat> if we concentrate uh, on the, the one side of the 3S menace. If we don't solve the one million people city per week with $10,000 per family, we have a problem. And the problem will mainly come from this 3S crisis, a social crisis, a sanitary crisis, and a security crisis. People won't, won't won't, will not stop, won't, uh, they will do not stop coming to cities, they will come anyhow, but they will live in awful conditions, in formal settlements, in slums and favelas. So this crisis of not being able to respond properly to the migration towards cities, uh, it's one big issue, and the city itself could be what we have been trying to implement through very concrete projects in our practice, and I guess part, is part of what is going to be shown at the Biennale here, is to be able to look at the city as a shortcut towards equality. Normally, there is, there's any agreement is that we do have an issue with inequalities, and the only thing we tend to listen is that in order to correct inequalities, we have to uh, implement income redistribution as if inequalities were just an economical issue. It's, it's far more complex than that. In any case, cities can be an alternative path to correct inequalities because if you identify strategically projects of public space, public transport, infrastructure and housing, you can improve quality of life in a relatively short period of time. In that sense, improve quality of, of life uh, through these projects, instead of having to depend or wait for that income redistribution only. So that's one side of the thing. The other, th the other new thing is that this um, social and sanitary and security crisis will require from us, and this is something I learned because of the Biennale, because of the joint venture with the UN Habitat from uh, Joan Claus, is he said that the city in itself can be a vehicle towards development. The way we were talking about and was taking notes in all of our conversations and it was extremely useful for us as practitioners is that he was saying in the UN, the developer's expert approach would be, okay, we will grow, we will eventually become rich and once we're rich, then will we create a good quality city. And his point thus was that if this triangle over there is followed, uh, the rule of law, the right financing, and the right design, the city in itself is the way through which you achieve development. You don't wait for it, you use the city as a tool for development. This proved, of course, as an architect, I think this was extremely uh, interesting, but this proved to be very right. One week ago, I was in a, in, a, in a lecture for a private investment bank, and this approach made a lot of sense to these people. If it made sense to them, means that there's a point there. Also meeting with mayors that eventually, instead of waiting for the Minister of Finance to give them money so that the city with the right approach in itself can then benefit the Minister of Finance and not the other way around. I think it's a very uh, important paradigm shift and I will try to, uh, to finalize uh, with this point. In any case, <clears throat> using the city as a shortcut towards equality, the point is that if these are the forces that if not addressed properly will create the built environment ahead, with this kind of footprint, what John Kloss was saying, that one of the crucial issues here is the role of public space. He was talking about the proportion of public to private space in a place like Manhattan, close to one to one. Per every square meter of public land, there's one square meter of developable land in a private way. And normally the approach of a developer would be 
okay, if I'm given a piece of land, I'm going to give a way for public space as little as possible so that I can sell as much land and, and have profit. But this is counterintuitive close point. We're saying the more right and proper public space you give away, the more profitable is going to be your own investment. Because when you have a ratio close to one to one, like in Manhattan, then each private initiative on the black thing over there in the mass gains value over time. If you move to informal settlements, that ratio drops to less than one to 10. For every square meter of private land, there's le less than uh, one tenth of public space, which makes that every individual private intervention and, in, uh, and investment goes down in value over time. So the role of public space, it's crucial in the creation of development, but also in a way to redistribute, it, redistribute quality of life. There are some examples uh, here at the Biennale, how to make a very efficient and innovative use of public space, like the project in Medellin that is presented here at the Arsenale for the transformation of water tanks into public space. A project at the Giardini of uh, the use of an old highway transformed into market uh, uh, transport hub uh, created by a former policeman, so an NGO, not only designer things here, or, or a politician, or a company like the Public Enterprises of Medellin. In this case, a former policeman tied, and this was a rather dangerous place, uh, that uh, abandoned piece of highway that now has been transformed into one of the most lively uh, places of Durban in South Africa. What Raul will show, uh, what we can learn from the, for this um, massive amount of people moving towards cities from uh, from uh, experiences like the Kumela, the requalification of peripheries, land architects, uh, Italian, French uh, practice, uh, requalifying peripheries. By the way, the, at the opening of the Biennale, for the first time in Biennale's history, was the Prime Minister Matteo Renzi. And at the opening, he made the announcement that given that Italy is uh, presiding G7 next year, he would like and actually it was uh, approved, 500 million euros to requalify peripheries to understand what was the possible role and relationship between architecture, politics, and quality of life. So I guess that these are the kind of, of signs uh, where we architects should be prepared to deliver if there's a, a such uh, an approach to deliver some concrete uh, uh, knowledge. And I guess these are some of the clues that one might get this is at the, at the Giardini as well. Kunle with a floating school, the role of infrastructure, or I guess in, inventive infrastructure, if there's not the conventional world, there are other ways to still deliver, uh, in this case, education uh, in Nigeria. The role of, of incremental housing, given these numbers, we won't be able uh, to solve the, the proper amount of people coming to cities unless we deliver incremental open systems to channel people's own capacity instead of resisting, seeing people as part of the solution and not as part of the problem. The same incremental approach by Bell Architects from Germany as incremental urbanism. So that's one end of the spectrum for which here at the exhibition there are some clues uh, for how to deal with them. So in just the three minutes that, I, I've been, uh, that are left, as I said before, a couple of months ago, we thought that this was already difficult enough to deliver or to have knowledge for how to create the one million people city per week. That, that if we don't solve it, we had a, an issue. But we found out that if we do solve it, we have an issue as well. Because if we built for such amount of people with the actual building systems that we have today and the carbon footprint, the amount of energy that is used in the building industry, then we end up with no planet. So we either choose a human social crisis or we choose an environmental crisis. The new thing here is that the environmental crisis is not just a green thing or let's say the Ministry of the Environment. Now the environmental crisis is connected to a security threat. 
the map of the wars on, on water shortage is exactly the same, the correlation is exactly the same with uh, conflicts, then the consequences on migration. What are the, the conflicts of those migration in the peripheries? So it's now, the report is not coming from the Ministry of the Environment, but from the Department of Defense in the US. So now the thing, I guess, it, it became something serious in the sense it's not just a hippie romantic thing about saving the planet, now it's a security threat. And for dealing with that kind of threat, I would say that at the Biennale we will witness uh, both uh, strategies. We will need hypertech and we will need infratech. So from the work of uh, almost no technology and non-skilled labor, like the Golden Lion winner, Solano Benitez from Paraguay, to have way of high-end design by Lord Foster, but using uh, sand bricks with very little energy embedded, <clears throat> to state-of-the-art engineering by Oxendorf Block and the Young in this pavilion uh, here at the, uh, at the Corderie, to using materials that has no industry behind, no lobby behind, like earth, Anna Heringer, or bamboo by Simon Veles in the central pavilion. In any case, just to, to conclude, what the John Claus was saying, and I, th I thought it was extremely illuminating, is that in order to tackle this issue, we, need, we may need to pay attention to this uh, triangle. Cities may become this shortcut towards equality, the, way, the vehicle towards development, or a way to deal with the environmental slash security threat, if we follow these three things. The right rule of law, the importance of the void and public space will be crucial. Patient capital, none of these issues will be solved if the way we finance these operations keep on asking of returns and profit of two digits, only one digit, and that will only happen if capital, instead of looking for uh, profitability, is looking for predictability, eventually, let's say, pension funds will be the kind of way to finance these kind of operations. Otherwise, we will never be able to deliver this kind of quality. And finally, good design. And I hope that while going through the Biennale, you will find some clues about how design can contribute with synthesis to these complex issues. Thank you. Can I just, before we move on to Raul, Prima. a couple of questions, Joe, you may want to add to this. Uh, in one of your sketches, you have the, the beautiful parabola uh, of one of the great engineers, and then you have Ban Ki-moon written next to it. Help, help us understand that. Where, where we, how does that work? Where does that interface well, happen? Between, it, it's just on. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I guess that we never thought there were, could be a connection. Actually, Donald Trump was, was uh, mocking Obama by, because he was saying that there was a connection between terrorism and uh, climate change. And the point was that the more we put a pressure on the environment, be it the water, be it the carbon emissions, then you're creating social conditions for people that may make, I, I, that they migrate or they will create conflicts, they will uh, be an issue with weaker institutions, and those uh, conflicts tend to happen in places where the, bio the environment is threatened first. So in this report from the Department of Defense, which I think is the, the, the new thing, the numbers and the facts are the same, but the, the, the fact that it's the Department of Defense now being worried but to be a security issue and the terrorism coming or being a consequence of that, has made it become now something that more decision makers are paying attention to. It's Ban Ki-moon there because after Obama said, and I think it was exactly one year ago, July 2015, not, not long before the Biennale opening, also uh, Ban Ki-moon said, agreed on that. So now we have more and more public figures agreeing on the relationship between 
uh, environment and, and this way. Why a bolt and brick is over there? Because we will need to create knowledge in using materials that are extremely available are ubiquitous, like mud, like bamboo, like wood, sand bricks, working with extremely simple uh, technologies, like the old arch or the old brick, or need to save energy, and the, the project about the, the bolt there can deliver this, this resistance with 30% of the matter that is used using conventional methods. So I guess this is the kind of knowledge that we need. Does this therefore imply a modesty? Does this, can you hear me? Okay, is the microphone on? Uh, does this, imp no, right? Can we have the sound up? Only you see, you're the director, that's what happened, right? right. Um, does this imply what you've just said? Uh, that the architect has to play a completely different role than maybe we've been used to, we'll talk about this more, of greater modesty. Yes and no. I guess that the kind of challenges will require a lot of boldness and audacity and, and really trust your, your... I mean, I guess if you're, you're confident in your knowledge, then you don't have problems that the starting point is outside architecture and outside yourself. And this, I guess, is the thing. The, the farther away from architecture is your starting point in, a, in issues that interest not only other architects, but the society at large. That's why the list of threats and challenges at the beginning, like inequalities, air, air pollution, waste, uh, poverty, migration. These are issues that every single person can have a say, that interest a normal citizen. The way we engage this non-specific conversation as architects is through the specific knowledge of architecture, which is to translate all those forces into a proposal. 